to the Insomni Cat Show with Nicolette and Brian. We'll get real deep with you, educating, inspiring, and solving problems with some of the most inspirational humans on the planet. Buckle up and come on the journey. I'm excited. Recording to the cloud. All right, guys, I'm Nick Lett, and today Brian and I are here with Trey Christensen. He is the director of growth over at First Blood, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about gaming, marketing, um, maybe the Air Force. I mean, you do so many things, Trey. I don't know. You might talk to us about anything. So we're, we're yeah. excited to. We're excited to. I, I don't know. Maybe about the Rambo reference in the name of First Blood. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it's definitely a fun name. It's been, it's been fun to build. So love it. Well, you know what? Why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey and how you got to where you are now? Yeah. So uh, uh, a little bit about uh, my background. So I'm definitely a gamer. I grew up uh, just gaming all sorts of you know systems, PC gaming, all that kind of stuff. My dad got me into it at a very young age. Um, was always really supportive. But um, over the years, uh, I knew that sort of approaching high school graduation, I didn't necessarily want to go off to college. So what I did is um, I started pursuing a career uh, in Halo, like the franchise game. Um, I started going around the, the country, sort of competing in different events and um, made a name for myself, a small name uh, in, in the pro realm of esports is what they call it now. It wasn't def- it definitely wasn't called esports back then. Um, but after that, I uh, sort of grew my career and I knew that I wanted to, even if I wasn't competing, I wanted to work in the space. Um, so about 2014, uh, the career of, you know, competition for me sort of ended. Um, I didn't see as much money in the space for Halo. Halo wasn't doing too well as a game. Um, and so I took a, made a transition into the Air Force, joined, um, and went off to training for about two years. Coming out of training, I saw a lot of careers start to pop up in the space, in the industry. Um, and I knew that I just needed to dive in with everything that I had. I started reaching out to old connections, people that I had competed with uh, against, all sorts of people that I had met uh, at different tournaments and uh, started to build more of a uh, business side career, especially on the sales side, um, sponsorship and you know a lot of marketing elements with that. Um, and from there, I just sort of uh, grew, worked at several different places, started my own business uh, in a space called Vast. And then um, I, I was ended up I got hired as the director of esports for Mavs Gaming, um, had a two year stint uh, with the Dallas Mavericks. And then after that, transitioned into working with First Blood full time, um, especially on focused on growth. So um, it's been it's been fun. So you made every kid's dream come true. You actually turned like video games into a career. I just want to be clear. That's how accidentally started. Accidentally. So there was definitely all of the. Uh, you know, doubts. I had a lot of friends tell me like, what are you doing with your life, man? Like all you're doing is just playing games. I mean, I would literally play 12 to 14 hours a day, like and sleep very minimally just to compete because I was so hungry for the competition. Um, And I had a lot of my buddies tell me that it wouldn't lead to anything. And I, it, it was less about really the career trajectory at that time. It was more so about like the people that you meet. Um, It's all about who you know, at the end of the day. So, you know, eventually, I, I would say as a collective, everyone knew that, you know, if you're a competitor, you eventually want to work in the space and stay in gaming, stay in esports. So all the people had a similar thought process to myself. They ended up finding jobs and, and starting careers in the industry, working on competitive strategy for new games, all sorts of stuff. And so that's where I saw a lot of opportunities as I reached out to them. I said, hey, what do you have for me? What can I work on? What can we work on together? You know, even at the time uh, when I first started, it's like, what can I do pro bono? What can I figure out to just get get the career started so I can build up my portfolio? Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you, you mentioned Halo, right? Because Halo was sort of at the beginning of sort of what you would consider esports, right? Or that competitive nature. But before that, I mean, back in the day, if you look back to like PC gaming, you had quake three you right. had Greg yeah. cornelia right that was a huge competition that i think the prize was like 100 grand even back then right then you had like all these but it's crazy if you think about how gaming's evolved because back then when it was just pc gaming before like things like the dreamcast came out right oh i was big was, on dreamcast right. oh you just brought up heart and soul right, 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 right. All right. All right. so but before that it was like you had to use things like game spy 
to even find a, a server to play on. Oh, you know, perfect. so because I used to actually one of the things I did in my past is I used to build gaming servers like that's what I did, you know, awesome. so you would actually have to figure out, how, you know, like, OK, where am I going to have my servers, things like that. And it was interesting, too, because I remember in I think it was Quake 3 and I could be wrong when it, when it came out on Dreamcast was the first time I ever saw advertising like actually built into the game. There were like billboards for real things in the real world built into Dreamcast. Oh, yeah. It's, it, you know. it's fascinating to see, you know, elements that, you know, you brought up, like you saw advertisements and stuff like that. I actually found Halo competitions. Um, a buddy of mine had like brought it up. We were playing a game and he was like, oh, there's these guys named the Ogre Twins and they make money playing Halo. And I was like, dude, there's no way you're lying. I was like, that's not that's not real. He was like, dude, it's on USA. So like the television channel, it was on USA. MLG had a contract where these guys would literally be on a main stage. They'd have these lights blaring down at them. And I was enamored because I had always played, you know, traditional sports, baseball. I was fairly decent. Basketball, I was terrible at because I didn't put any time into it. But, you know, um, I was a big gamer. And so when I saw the spotlights on these guys, I was like, oh, my gosh, I just want to be in the spotlight. I want to earn a, and build a name for myself. That's all I cared about. So it's fascinating to sort of see how that has transitioned. And now you've got, you know, ESPN, esports, you've got all these different right. like sectors just blowing up and everyone sees that, you know, the digital um, age is sort of growing, especially like Twitch, Twitch viewership is, mm -hmm. is at an all time high. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. Yep. So now you have, if you, now you have, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you bring up a good point. It's not even about, for, for some of the people on Twitch, it's not even about the competitive gaming. They're basically using the gaming as a reason to stream to build an influencer audience. I mean, that's literally, because some of them, some of even the big ones aren't really even that good at some of the games they're playing. Let's let's be honest, right? But they have a huge following because of their personality or how they react to what's going on in the game. You know, so yeah. it's pretty crazy. And what's crazy is you see it across the board, not even in like sort of, you know, like whatever, like first person shooters or real competitive games, but you even see like, I mean, people look at all the people that are playing roadblocks and just streaming it or oh, like yeah. it's, in, it's insane, right? <laughs> I love, I love going to the just chatting section on Twitch, which is literally just someone sitting there talking to chat um, and they don't do, they don't have any sort of agenda necessarily um, they're just there to engage and communicate with people and there's just massive streamers i mean they'll have 5000 6000 viewers live mm -hmm. just like talking about nothing except for their lives and whatever's going on you know drama pulling up tiktok videos laughing about it together right. it's like it's incredible so twitch is has sort of evolved even outside of gaming and you're starting to see more of a I, they call it IRL culture in real life culture mm -hmm. and it's like it's very fun to see how that's playing into gaming and esports and how it's very like cohesive. So super interesting. Yeah. So how, I mean, I guess, so the question is how have you seen really marketing <laughs> evolve with this? Yeah. So we're in sort of this weird uh, transition period. This is, you know, just marketing one-on-one in general. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, paid media strategy has gone in a completely different direction. Organic, uh, the concept of organic on a lot of social medias isn't there anymore. Um, and platforms are sort of scaling back the organic reach of a lot of accounts, even Facebook, you know, uh, 2011, when you saw sort of a company's approach to posting on Facebook, it was like, yeah, let's get out, get out our posts, let's get organic posts out there. Now you post organically on Facebook and unless you put any sort of paid media behind it, it's mm -hmm. completely stale, it's dead. So um, the marketing aspect especially has been interesting to sort of figure out. I think right now we've been really focused on influencers, TikTok. TikTok is definitely one of the most organic platforms right now that I've come across. And so we're looking to work with a lot of TikTok influencers and uh, see how we can harness that, convert them into to, you know, cold uh, or warm fans of the first blood name and sort of tournaments that we're running and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's it's costly to, to get out there in the world, especially on the marketing end nowadays, just because each one of these social platforms is looking to monetize that. Right. So. And, I, and I think, too, I mean, you bring up influencers, right? Because that's a whole other piece. It's like almost working like each one is like an individual ad agency, right? You're mm -hmm. almost like working out some sort of contract with each of these influencers. You know, Every so it, it becomes, 
yeah, it becomes really complex when you start trying to build because we do that in in certain spaces. We work with a lot of influencers, and it becomes very complex mm -hmm. to manage all of them at certain points. Oh, absolutely. It's it's been. Um, I didn't think it would be as time consuming as it has been, um, but it it really takes up a lot of creative um, energy to like put into. Mm -hmm. Uh, investing in building a strategy, right? You have to build something that can plug into what they're already doing. You also got to take into all sorts of, you know, considerations like, does it fit their brand? Does it fit their style? Are they comfortable doing mm -hmm. it? You know, all that stuff, which I know you guys already probably know about, but it's like, man, it takes yeah. a lot more time than people think. Yeah, absolutely. And now I'll let Nick uh, go back to her questions. Like, uh, yeah, we're just yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I know, I know it was going to be a little quiet today. Yeah. When you guys started talking about things that I've never heard of. Yeah. So, <laughs> by the way, by the way, I mean, this is a little bit old school, and I'm definitely older than you, but did you ever play Kingpin? Do you remember Kingpin? <laughs> it was like one of the most bizarre first person shooters it was like you were like mob <laughs> bosses and you could actually like flamethrow people light them on fire throw them off buildings oh it was like God. it was like it was like crazy i mean obviously the graphics today you know just like horrible but you're talking about probably like late 90s it was like one of the funniest like first person shooters ever i'm sorry it was just like was comic. it was it very similar to like doom graphics like doom one the original no, like, it was, it was more like it was it was more like around Quake Three, okay, like okay, era. Okay. Like it was, it was more. In line with, <laughs> no, it wasn't too too bad, but it's still. I mean, you compare it to what goes on, you know, even in the last ten years, you know, it's so archaic. Oh, so. it's definitely, it's definitely blowing up rapidly, and like even the games that are coming out now, like New World and all these, you know, MMOs and first person shooters, like mm -hmm. they're on a totally another level. So yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great segue to talking about the technology and the evolution of technology <laughs> and how how technology, uh, you know, how that evolution has has evolved the you know the the gaming space in general. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you talk about graphics, Brian. That's one aspect. I mean, Trey, mm -hmm. what what do you think about that evolution and and the role technology has played? Yeah, I mean, it's been um, it's been sort of uh, explosive. I mean, I don't think really anybody expected esports to blow up in this facet. Um, I definitely don't think that people saw these large games um, taking over a majority of people's time spent, like free time spent. Um, and it's even, it's interesting to even see sort of the segue of how that affects like your so social realm. Um, I remember, you know, 2008, I'm graduating high school. People are talking about how, you know, you have in real life friends and then you have online friends. And now it's not even, they're not even differentiated at all. It's like friends are just friends. And it's a very normal thing to just get onto a game and play with each other, you know, across the globe. I, I play with buddies that are in Europe um, and that's very normal now. So it's interesting to see how that um, has played out. I mean, I even remember, um, platforms that were you know um meeting online and things like that in gaming groups were very um looked down upon so to speak and now that's become the norm so it's very interesting to see how that sort of played into like the technology aspect growing so rapidly has played into the social side of things um, and how friends are even perceived so it's awesome do you, i mean so like let's just because that's actually interesting right yeah, you know you've always I, been I able to connect with you always been able to connect with people like originally you were able to connect with people you know you would meet people mm -hmm. like that were on the same servers right but then i'm not sure if it was at xbox but xbox really put a social aspect to was probably the first one like the original xbox that put a social aspect to gaming itself like actually just not even in the game do you know what i mean like not yep. while you were in the game they added a social aspect to the whole platform itself Yep, the d the direct messages and stuff. Uh, right. You know, just re receiving either hate messages or yeah. you know following up after a game where you saw someone play really well and you're like, dude, that you played amazing. You know, and I'm holding a controller as I say that, not a phone. But right. um, <laughs> anyways, it's like uh, you know you would compliment somebody. Next thing you know, that compliment could lead to, hey man, you 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 played really well too, and then an invite. Now you've made sort of a comrade and you play together. That's literally how I ended up going to my very first tournament. And I was I was just playing online. I played really well. This guy invited me. He ended up being one of my closest friends. And we just met playing a game online. I ended up going to 19 competitive tournaments with him. Um, and we pretty much had our whole, you know, gaming career together. Um, and now he's, you know, working in, in a totally different industry and he's super successful. But 
um, it's just fascinating to sort of see how that played out. Like, I right. didn't know I was going to be playing. I, I could have made a split second decision to get a sandwich in the kitchen and never met that guy. So it's like, right. it's incredible. Message from you. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting too, because, you know, it's like, you know, think about this. You're, you were building your network, which I think you referenced at the beginning. Like you were basically building your network with people that had a common interest, even if they were in different aspects of their careers or different things they did. They had a common interest in gaming, which brought everyone together at a, at a different level. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the biggest rules that I sort of uh, rule to life and being successful with anything that I've sort of done is I apply the a very simple rule of just show up as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So whether it be, you know, gaming conventions to network with people on the business side now, um, just showing up and, and, and saving face like every single time talking with people in person, that means a lot. So I've seen a lot of sponsorship deals play out because of that fact. I've seen a lot of um, you know, even like on the competitive side, showing up to every single tournament without skipping tournaments was a big deal because people could rely on you to always be there and be an available teammate. Um, if you showed up at every event, then people were like, okay, if I team with this guy, he's not going to no show or he's not going to disappear on me. He's not going to whatever, which was very common at the time. So uh, just sort of that simple rule of just just show up did probably 90% of the networking for me. Um, it wasn't necessarily anything to do with me as a unique individual, but more so I was always there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's good. You're stuck with me. Yeah, right. right. I'll always right. I'm here. Always here. He's like, I'm online 24 <laughs> seven. It doesn't yeah. matter. You open up Halo. I am there. <laughs> yep. Team or no team. I will be there. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That so that was fun. Well, you know, you talk about sponsorships too. And Brian, I know this is something you wanted to talk about, um, mm-hmm. you know, how how those sponsorships have evolved. Because we've now, we've talked about kind of, we've touched on getting the audience, right? And those different tactics and marketing there. But now how do you go and get those advertisers? So where does that come into play? How has that changed? And, you know, are there any challenges there as well? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing for, for us right now um, is we're trying to get creative. We're trying to package and activate um, creators together to do different tournament series. Um, Just like I mentioned earlier with a lot of the same issues around organic, um, your organic reach on social media, um, since that's turned into the pay to play game, it's like these uh, sponsors or companies that are looking to acquire users or purchasers or fans of their products or whatever it may be are in the same boat that we're in, in terms of growth, they're trying to find creative ways um, to spend their marketing dollars. So the only thing that we've really been able to do, um, especially lately, is really package together very creative um, ideas and concepts and then take it to sponsors and say, hey, this is something new. We want to do this together. Are you willing to, to take a leap of faith and do this with us? Um, and I think that our learnings along the way have been very beneficial because then we're able to take those case studies back to either the same sponsor or, or you know future sponsors and say hey this is what worked this is what didn't you know we would love to take it to the next level or we would love to do you know this sort of similar idea with you so that's how we've seen a lot of the sponsorship conversations play out lately and we just try to be as creative as possible to test as many variables as we can uh, just because everything's pay to play do, do you find that like you know Okay, so, you know, there's different types of games, right? And probably different types of personalities play because, you know, people across the board, you know, play video games, right? You know, so you have all different demographics. Um, Now, do you find like, okay, if it's like a first person shooter, maybe more of those are, you know, more of those people have a tendency to be from the military or if they play, you know, an RPG, most of them are a little bit more nerdy and into whatever reading, right? Do, Do you? are you able to segregate some of those things with the marketing? You know, is it, is, are you able to pull even other data, you know, stuff I'm probably not even thinking about at this point. Yeah. So the, I think the community aspect for sure is um, really interesting in evaluating different games. So uh, one thing that we have, like on our platform, we have a really, really big Latin America um, fan base and following of active users for Dota 2. And then on the other end of things, we have a huge North America um, following and fan base of active users for Warzone. So those two two games are in t- totally separate regions. And the behavior of those two demographics are completely different. So uh, when we pitch to a sponsor, we're sort of pitching 
um, different concepts based on the behavior of some of those um, people in that region. So um, it's super interesting to see like what sponsors want, where they're looking to target. I know a lot of people talk about North America, North America, North America in terms mm -hmm. of sponsorships, but we've seen a really heavy emphasis on other countries as well, even a heavy emphasis on EU um, and, um, uh, you know, even Asia and stuff like that. Um, we've, you know, Apex Legends was a big game. We see a, a, a huge following for Apex Legends of Japan. So we've had that conversation with sponsors, you know, is that a target target market? So um, yeah, it's definitely different per game. There's definitely the stereotype uh, mm -hmm. of like military guys playing Warzone and Call of Duty and stuff like that, but um, it's wildly different per game in their behaviors mm -hmm. and their likes and dislikes and stuff like that. So yeah, by the way, Call of Duty is probably one of the best games ever created. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely, I would put it up there. Warzone's a big one. I know that they have a lot of um, like issues, you know, going back and forth with you know cheaters and all sorts of stuff that that mm -hmm. Activision needs to fix. But um, yeah. it's it's a very substantial game. A lot of yeah. people play it. Wait a minute, is that the one with the Nazi zombies? Yes, that's Call of Duty. Okay, I've played that. That's, 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 that's one of them. That's one of them. Yeah. There, I used to yeah. play that at, at Blockbuster. We had a television <laughs> in the Blockbuster. That's that was awesome. date night. That was date night when my husband and I first met. I swear to God. Uh, <laughs> that's a good date night. That sounds like well, fun. We also, Far, Far Cry had Nazi zombies, too. <laughs> so it's a lot I, of games with Nazi zombies. Yeah, it could be. It could be, it could be. Uh, I, I give myself one point, so I get my <laughs> Far Cry. I'm just saying, like, the original Far Cry was Nazi zombies, wasn't it? <laughs> So, you know, um, I don't even know what I was going to talk about. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Nazi no, zombies. You just want a game. Yeah. You want to relive the date. I feel you. It's, a, it's good. That's good. That's yeah. where we want you to be, a gamer. That's perfect. <laughs> right. Well, we're, you know, I mean, you're, we're talking about esports, right? Now, do you prefer, I mean, do you prefer that terminology now with the way things are? Do you think that's not really, is that taking hold a little bit? Or are people just still calling them? like video games? Yeah, it, I, I guess it depends on the the kind of context involved. So esports is typically very like uh, professional, you know, top of the line gamers that are putting in, uh, you know, 12, 14 hours a day into whatever specific game it is. Um, and esports sort of encompasses a lot of different elements, but I would say more so like in a broad terminology, everything's just sort of gaming. Um, that's what I would prefer. Um, I would say that there are elements even to like First Blood as a tournament platform. We're running, um, you know, esports competitions just because it it offers a platform for players to be able to build a name for themselves. But I wouldn't necessarily say that we're specific only to esports because um, there's all sorts of fun things that we do just from a gaming perspective that um, don't necessarily fit that professional esports narrative. There's a lot of casual gamers that just want to play in a competition. They're not necessarily trying to to build a name for themselves or pursue a professional career. They're just looking to have fun on a weekend with some buddies, maybe win some money. Um, so that's more of falls in like the gaming side of things. So that's sort of how I differentiate okay. the two. So you you know. I think that's a perfect time to talk about First Blood and tell us a little bit about what you're doing over there at First Blood and, and you know, where we can, you know, how people can get involved and what you've got going on there. Yeah. So First Blood is a uh, tournament platform. We currently have uh, a few games on there right now that uh, are, we're heavily integrated into. So it's PUBG, Warzone, Dota 2 and Free Fire. Um, and Dota 2 and, and Warzone are sort of our pillars that we're building um, into a much larger scene, especially in South America and then North America being more focused on like war zone. But um, what we've been doing over the past uh, year is we're in sort of a growth year um, and we've been just focused on activating with influencers, creating more tournament series, trying to offer as many free to enter tournaments as possible just so people can have fun and win quick, easy cash. Uh, we try to simplify the process a lot. So a lot of tournament platforms will offer, you know, free to entry tournaments that earn you credits and then you can go take those credits and buy into a, a larger prize pool event. And it's, it's sort of like a multi-step process. We try to cut that out and just literally make it cash super quick, 
enter fast and um, hopefully the tournament doesn't take too long. So we try to make it uh, fit into people's days. And this has given us the ability to sort of reach a much larger portion of the casual gaming audience of people that are just looking to play in like one tournament a week or something like that. So definitely gaming, definitely a little bit of esports, but uh, we try to cater to, you know, a little bit larger of an audience than just the top tier players, so to speak. That's awesome. And can you let everybody know where they can, that's firstblood.io, correct? Yes, firstblood.io. Um, and uh, it should be super quick and easy to sign up. It should take less than a minute. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Trey. Thank you for educating me today. Um, I, I know I was a little quiet, but <laughs> this isn't my thing. But you know what? I, I love that there's, um, you know, there's a business aspect to that, which I find really, really cool. The, the business of gaming. Right. And uh, it sounds like there's some innovative stuff going on there. So that's very exciting. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on today and um, getting a chance to talk about First Blood and sort of the things that we're doing. And I uh, was able to nerd out a little bit on the gaming uh, with Brian, which is always fun. He said Dreamcast and instantly won me over. So that's easy. Awesome. Well, thank you so thank much, Trey. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it, everyone.